This video is looking at an intro to project networks for networks and decision mathematics. So looking at precedence tables and activity networks. Project networks or an activity network is a way of organising um, separate activities that are needed to complete an entire project. So if we think of project management, um, so let's say we're building a house, there would be a number of different activities or miniature jobs that would need to occur throughout the entire overall project and they would need to happen in a certain order. Um, sometimes things could be happening simultaneously but other times certain jobs need to be completed before the next thing can be done. So for instance the plaster needs to be put up before we can start painting. So there are some things that make sense and other things that um, don't necessarily come to mind that way. So we generally represent um, these projects as a directed network. So we can see an example there. Some of the key differences is that we label um, our edges as opposed to the vertices. And so each of these edges here in this network represent a different activity. So activity H we can see there and the number is the duration or the weight on the edge. So activity H might take three weeks. Um, we also can look at uh, what we call precedence tables and that's a different way of representing the information in a table form rather than a network form. We tend to use these networks to help us work out what is the minimum time required to complete the project as well as other things such as what um, needs to happen in what order and what activities are critical to that completion time. When we're looking at these precedence tables, there's a number of things that um, may be included, but the most common and the most useful things are um, the duration. So that's the time it takes to complete a particular activity and the predecessors or what we might call the immediate predecessors. So the immediate predecessor listed in the table if we look here for activity b we're told an immediate predecessor is activity a so that means visually activity b cannot commence until activity a has been completed it is the activity that leads into the vertex from which b commences or b starts so we can see there as well for activity c Activity A is also an immediate predecessor. Looking at the other activities there, so activity E has activity C as a predecessor. So we can see here activity E, looking at the vertex from which E starts, that means activity C must finish at that point. So that's telling us that I can't do activity E until C is finished. So you might be given a graph, a network, and asked to fill in some gaps in a table. Or you might be given the table and required to construct the network. Usually though, um, you're not asked to do something from scratch, but it is a useful way of working so that um, if you get a tricky question that only gives you a table, you need to understand what the information is telling you so that if you wanted to draw a visual of it, you could. Firstly, an example here of constructing a precedence table from a graph. The things you want to look for is making sure that all of the activities in the network are represented. So going through generally they're in some sort of alphabetical order. And so just making sure that you've got all of the activities listed in the table. The next step is to note the duration of each one. So remember the duration is just the value that is on the edge next to the letter for that particular activity. So if we to complete this, we're looking activity E has a duration of four, F a duration of three, G duration of five, H two, I three, and finally J four. Finally, we're looking at the predecessors. So we're making sure that we're noting down all of the um, activities that end at the vertex where this next activity commences. So if we're looking at activity G, 
we locate G on our network and check this vertex here, so where G starts from. So what activities are flowing into the end of there or are finishing at that point? C and D. So they are what we call our immediate predecessors. So we put activity C and activity D. If we now look at H, we can see for activity H, E ends just prior. So E is our predecessor for H. For activity I, we can see G is the predecessor. And then finally for activity J, we have H, F and I all coming in to finish at that vertex where J commences. So F, H and I. Um, normally we would put those in alphabetical order, but it's not a requirement as long as the correct activities are listed. Next, we look at constructing project networks from the precedence table. So if you have to draw something from scratch, so from the beginning, it's a good idea to draw it in pencil because it can sometimes be tricky or challenging to visualise how the edges should flow um, until you get partway through and you realise maybe you could draw it a bit better. What you are looking for though, any edge that has no predecessor, so like A and B here in the table, that means that they commence at the start. So we have a start of our project and so we know that activity A and activity B will commence at that start point. And so we can add in our weights and we have activity A and B drawn in. Next then we're looking for what flows from that point. So activity A is a predecessor for both C and D. So let's pop in activity C. at 5 and activity D and that had a duration of 3. Next we've got B as a predecessor for activity E and it can be useful then to check ahead and see where things might join in. So I can see D and E become, will join together so they will come into the same vertex to become the predecessor for G. So here I can say, well, E it comes from the end of activity B there, and it joins into that same vertex with D. And so popping my labels on there. From there, um, F is a predecessor, uh, has a predecessor of C, and then F itself is a predecessor for H, and then G and H join together. So thinking about, we've already said that G will come from the, this point here where D and E come in. So we can put that in, G10. And we need to put in C, F, at six, and that will join in so you can see here that where it's where it might be useful to use pencil so you can adjust as you go so h5 and then finally i has predecessors h and g so i there now if an activity doesn't appear in the list of predecessors that means it flows to the finish point. So we can see here, we can account for activity A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, but activity I is missing. So we can be confident that I flows to the finish line there, or to the finish vertex. So as I said, unlikely that you would need to draw a full network from the table, but it is a very useful tool if you do get a more challenging question without that visual and you find that the visuals are um, helpful for you. Now looking at something a little different. Sometimes in a project we have um, activities that are required 
as predecessors or different combinations of predecessors. So in the network that we have here, we can see that S is a predecessor to V. So activity V cannot commence until S has been completed. We can see really clearly that T is a predecessor to activity W. So again, T must be completed before W can commence. However, we have this little edge that we call a dummy edge. And it, I liken it to a secret passage or, or a, um, a missing link in a project. It's not actually an activity, but it is a way of linking in to say, in actual fact, activity W needs both S and T to be completed before it can commence. But we don't want to tie or make activity V wait for T to also finish. So V can, can carry on independently whether T has been completed or not. We don't have to delay or wait um, in that space of the project. So when we're listing our predecessors, what that looks like in the table, as we said, S is our immediate predecessor for activity W. But both S and T are predecessors for activity W. And so whenever you see this in the table, in our um, activity table, we want to make sure that anywhere where a particular predecessor occurs, if it is not a perfect match, so if the combination of activities isn't exactly the same, like in this case. So I can see I've got S on its own, but then I've got S paired with T. So that's an indication for us that a dummy edge will be required when we represent this as a network. Now a dummy edge, like I said, is just a secret passage. It doesn't add anything to the activity or the project itself. It doesn't have a time. So it usually is represented as a dotted line, as we can see in the example here. Um, sometimes it has the word dummy written next to it. It definitely still has a direction, so it will have an arrow to indicate which way that um, predecessor is being dragged through. Um, and often it will have noted, if it's not the word dummy, it will have noted that it has a weight of zero. So we still need to consider it when we're thinking about how our project flows. Um, however, just note it will never add anything to the timing of a project. Here's a quick example of how you might need to interpret that activity table, um, a precedence table, and how you can identify where the dummy should be. So we have here an example, a project involves nine activities, A to I, the immediate pre predecessors of each activity is shown in the table below. A directed network for this project will require a dummy edge. So even if I didn't know that, I'll show you how I can identify it from the table. And we're being asked to say, where is the dummy activity needed? So where should it be drawn? So when I'm looking at the list of uh, predecessors, so anywhere where you see the same predecessor, you want to check that the combination of predecessors is the same. So there we've got A needed for both B and C, and it's just A in both cases, so that's all right. Then we see that activity B is needed for D, but also at E. Now the issue here is that just B is required as a predecessor for activity D, whereas both B and C are required as um, predecessors for activity E. So that tells me where I've got this anomaly, where the predecessors don't match fully, that I need a dummy activity. And what I can work out from here is that the activity must go from the end of the common activity to the end of other activity. So I'm just writing that simply. So what that means in this case is that the dummy edge will go from the end of activity B to the end of 
of activity C. Now that answer isn't necessarily in that format in our options here, but we can see we're going from the end of, so we know it has to be from the end of activity B. So we can eliminate option C, D and E. Then reading the rest of the options, it says the start of activity C or the start of activity E. Now we've said it has to be to the end of the other predecessor. So we need it to go to the end of C. So it can't be A because of that. Okay. So why is the correct answer B? Well, if we look at back at the precedence table, activity C is a predecessor for activity E. So that means it's going to the start of activity E. So the end of that common, uh, sorry, the end of the other activity C is also the start of activity E. And therefore making B our best and most correct answer there. So that's a common way when you'll see dummy edges. In the next video, when we're looking at how we ascertain overall project time, so the minimum completion time, we'll also look at how we deal with dummy edges through that um, process. That's it for this video. Thanks.